All right, my dear friends, let's uh, invite the Lord into our time and we will get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day and I thank you for bringing us together today to open up your word. Lord, as always, we ask that you will guide us and direct us in all truth. Uh, our general topic, Lord, is still on spiritual warfare, but we're touching on a very, very critical part of it, Lord, as you know today. And we need to understand this very well because this is what we're going to be facing from this point forward. So, Lord, we invite you into this time. I pray you'll prepare our hearts to receive your word and truth. And, Lord, may it all be for your glory and for the good of your people. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, ladies, um, today we're not going to start with Scripture. We're going to spend the rest of our time on Scripture. And what I'm going to do instead is start with quotes from three different sources. The majority of them are from three different sources, and I'll let you know who they are. But first, let me tell you what the topic is. The topic is going to be regarding the Methodist Church and what they have just accomplished, what that means for them and their church, as well as what that means for us. And we've got a number of passages that we are going to be referring to. The three sources in particular, and you can feel free to Google this because that's how I found them. Um, the three sources that I used, which seem to be somewhat reputable anyhow, and that have quoted people from the church itself, are um, Christianity Today, AP, which is the Associated Press, and Forbes. So I'm letting you know that right up front. I'm not pulling these quotes out of the air and um the things that refer to actual numbers um are also taken from some of these sources and um so let me just give you quotes out of these articles and several more that i read so that you can get a good idea of what has just transpired, how long it has taken them to get to this point, and what it's going to mean from this point forward. So the biggest problem with what happened that some may not be really clear on is that the United Methodist Church, which I'll just abbreviate by saying UMC, struck down the UMC's long-standing anti-LGBTQ policies and created a path for ousted clergy who have either performed same-sex marriages or who are in a same-sex relationship themselves. This these ousted clergy are seeking reinstatement. And on top of the fact that this obviously pertains to men, one of the things that has already been in place in the Methodist Church for quite some time, that still continues to be there, is they ordain women pastors. And I know some will argue what Paul says regarding this, that he has no women pastors or elders. 
And Paul's reasoning for that goes all the way back to what the Lord ordained in the Garden of Eden, which is the fact that the man is responsible for the woman. We saw when we talked about the fall of man, that it didn't matter to God that Adam remained silent the whole time that Eve was being tempted by Lucifer himself. For at the end of it all, and when they fell, who's the one that God pursued first? It was Adam, because Adam was responsible for Eve. Just because someone doesn't want to honor their responsibility does not mean that they can just take their hands off and go hide somewhere and let the woman Take the fall. God pursued Adam. And God asked Adam what he had done. It didn't matter that Eve is the one that put herself in that place. Adam was still responsible. This is what the Lord has ordained from the beginning. He holds the man responsible. And I know that goes against a lot of what the world teaches today. But I stand by what the word of God says. And it's got nothing to do with ability. It's got nothing to do with giftedness. But the primary argument that Paul has especially when there's problems within a church, is the fact that there's only one head. When the two become one, if both are trying to be the ones that are responsible or in charge, for the family, for the household, for the marriage, there's going to be clashes all over the place. So Paul lays it out for us. And Paul says this. Men are to lay down their lives for their wives in the same way that Jesus laid his life down for the church. Then, and only then, are the women to submit to the authority of the man. Not if the man has got an ego problem, and just wants to be in charge of everything and treat the woman like garbage. That is not what God commands. It's to be done in the context of not only the love of God, but also the laying down of one's life. for the sake of the woman. Then the woman can help avoid clashes by yielding to the authority of the one that the Lord has called for that role. And that's what it is. It's a role. It doesn't mean that males are superior to females. It says that nowhere in scripture. But it becomes a problem when in one household, 
two parties that are supposed to be one are clashing over everything. The same is true in the church. The Lord has called the roles of pastor and elder in particular to men. That means that the women have, it doesn't mean that women have no responsibility and nothing to do in the church. It doesn't mean that at all. But Paul says the woman is not to have authority over the man. And we see by what the Lord did in Genesis 3 that he upheld his word because while Adam and Eve are running and trying to hide, God sought out Adam first. And we know the rest of the story. Adam blamed both God and Eve for the situation. Eve turns around and blames the serpent for the situation. No one takes responsibility for anything. That's the bottom line. That's not the way it's supposed to function. Now I'm saying this specifically for the church because when you're where you're going to violate God's word, you can expect trouble. If you are ordaining ministers, bishops, elders, you're going to have problems because the scriptures make no provision for it. That doesn't, again, mean that women cannot serve. But there's going to be problems and clashes when you've got two different entities, button heads, and each one has their own agenda. There's going to be problems. And I believe that was part of the problem that led up to what the Methodist Church has just done. They struck down all the LGBTQ, I'm not even sure what all those letters mean, but they struck down all the anti-LGBTQ policies that the church had established. And immediately, at least one of these articles, switched their focus to one of the clergy that was ousted for being in a same-sex relationship. And wanted to know what they thought and felt about the possibility of being reinstated. Do you see in today's world that there's clearly an agenda that the enemy is behind? Forget the fact that we've allowed all this stuff in the first place. The biggest thing that the media can talk about is what they're going to do when they're reinstated. As if there's no problem with any of that. Instead of recognizing that all along there's been a problem with this, and the church has done absolutely nothing about it. That's just the introductory statement that one of these articles made. Another quote was that the one who wants to be, or one of them that wants to be reinstated, also wants to celebrate communion. Now, what happened to prior to us celebrating the Lord's Supper, we confess and we repent of our sin. 
I guess that doesn't apply here. A third quote, again, from the same person that wants to be reinstated is that on top of everything else, on top of her being ousted and all that, she ended up divorcing her wife and they have co-parented a daughter. But now that they're not together, I guess that single parent homes apply just as much to the gay lifestyle as to what the rest of the world is doing. So now we're not just talking a violation as to what God had established for his church, but we've welcomed the LGBTQ lifestyle, two women married, and then they divorced, which God hates divorce, And then a child is left to grow up in a single parent home. How is this a benefit? How is this any better than what the rest of the world is doing? So all we're doing in essence is adding yet more sin to the sin we're already committing. And the worst part about it is nowhere in any of these places that I referred to, is there one ounce of repentance? Not one. The ones that are looking to be reinstated because they feel they were ousted unfairly have not confessed or repented of one single sin. Not one. By the descriptions of what the what Paul has laid out for the shepherds, for pastoral roles, roles bishop roles, etc., none of them should be taking the office of pastor for that very reason. Their hearts are hardened, they're indifferent to sin and rebellion. But that's okay, because we're a liberal faith. And we're still calling, or still doing what the Lord asked us to do. What a horrible, horrible perspective to have. No humility, no brokenness, no conviction. Now, ladies, what does the fact that there is no conviction of the Holy Spirit mean for any of us? If there is no conviction of the Holy Spirit, more times than not, it's because the Holy Spirit is not present in the life of that individual. And if they're living in sin and rebellion, that's evidence of that fact. You tell a tree by the fruit it bears, right? This runs far deeper than just striking down any unfair treatment against the LGBTQ community. This is opening the doors to bring the filth from the world into the church, thereby corrupting the church on top of it. No conviction whatsoever. There was a quote from someone else again, that you'll be able to find in whatever articles you were to research. There's a quote from someone else regarding this individual that was 
ousted from her clergy role. And here's what this other lady says. Quote, she became known throughout the world as a martyr. As a martyr for those who call themselves God's children and are identified in the LGBTQ community. Reinstatement, I'm still quoting, is an act of reconciliation and restorative justice. Why well, can assure all of us that if one is looking for justice, they'll find it. But the ones that have turned from the Holy God and his word and have brought all this in to the church, thereby corrupting the church, there will be justice served as well. I wonder what Paul and the other apostles would say to this quote, where this woman pastor is called a martyr for standing up for the LGBTQ community. When in the days of Paul and the apostles, they were true martyrs who went to a martyr's death. Everything from beheading to being eaten alive by animals to being split in two by being tied to two horses, going two different directions and literally ripping them apart. That's martyrdom. And they did it for Jesus Christ and for the faith and for what he taught not for a cause, a cause that at its root is rebellious against God's holy word. God calls it an abomination. I know you won't be surprised by this, neither was I, but that word never even came up. That's what God calls it, but they won't acknowledge that. It shows you how doctored up the authorized gay community scriptures must be if that word is no longer even mentioned. That's yet another sad reality that you have got to change the word of God. And you have to create a God in your own image. In order to get the backing for sin and rebellion. When you step back and look at that reality, You've got to wonder how the church is even still standing and why the Lord hasn't already destroyed it. The quotes go on. The United Methodist Church was the last of the major mainline Protestant groups 
to repeal the LGBTQ policies. That means others have already passed all this through. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Another quote, inclusivity, more openness, and the opportunity for people to be their authentic selves is the goal here. To be their authentic selves. Obviously, the claim here being that we were born that way. Well, using that line of thought, if I drank or did drugs, I was born that way. God created me that way. It's not sin. It's who I am. No, it's not. It's sin. The gay lifestyle is sin just like any other sin. Well, we're getting ourselves into trouble is we're not calling it what it is. So since the LBGTQ movement is sexual in nature, instead of drinking or doing drugs, what if I was to say that I'm a fornicator? I'm a fornicator. God made me that way. And I just can't avoid the temptation. That's who I am. That's me. Using their own words, I'm just being my authentic self. That's all. What if I was an adulterer? I'd be able to make the same claim. Sexual sin for sexual sin. I'm an adulterer. God made me that way. And I'm just living out my life and being my authentic self. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Call it what it is. It's sin. Adultery is sin. Fornication is sin. And same-sex relationships are sin. Period. But we can't do that. After all, Inclusivity and more openness is an opportunity for people to be their authentic selves. All they're proving is that God and his word is absolutely right. We're all sinners. And we're flaunting our sin around and parading it through Main Street America and around the world as if there's no consequence to it. After all, God is a God of love, isn't he? If anyone would understand, wouldn't it be him? No, it wouldn't be him. He does call it what it is, and he gives us the remedy to confess it and repent of it, that we may be saved. But nobody wants to hear that part because they don't want to turn from the world. 
if I am involved as a drug addict, a drinker, a fornicator, or an adulterer, and I remain in that, I'm remaining in that by my choice. I'm not a victim of anything. I am willfully choosing to do it. And there is no difference. If people, and I know of people, that have turned away from that lifestyle, if it was something genetic, if it was something that God made them to be that way, how would they be able to turn away from it? It's lies. It's all lies. And now we're corrupting the church and have been for millennia. What happened to calling these things sin? What happened to the fear of God? None of that exists anymore. There is no fear of God. We're standing up proudly. In some of the pictures that some of these articles had, you know what's prominently displayed right in front of the churches that support this? The gay flag. One side is the flag of the United States, and on the other side is the gay flag. Right in front of the church. Now, that's not promoting an agenda. See, this is where the sin leads to deception and even delusion. And this is also where the Lord only puts up with it for so long before he gives them over to it. And he gives them a depraved mind. That's where we're at. Another quote, the UMC removed the language calling the practice of homosexuality incompatible with church teaching. Since when? And why don't other sins apply? If people follow this lifestyle and they say they have no choice but because that's the way they are, then how could anyone ever leave that lifestyle and yet there's people that leave it every day and if they still insist it's true then all the other sexual sin would apply as well if i'm an adulterer that's who i am i have no choice but god will cut me some slack because he's the one that made me that way. Then why did he call same-sex relationships an abomination? There's no consistency whatsoever. And yet the ones that'll say anything about it are the ones that could be imprisoned for it. And the ones that have committed the sin are off the hook temporarily.
another quote. And this is from the same one that stood behind this ousted pastor. She says, I think this decision is putting more love into the world. Love, that's what we're calling it. It's putting more love into the world and is putting in more good things than bad things. Overall, it is really a great thing. An ousted pastor from the Methodist Church questions or says, why did God make me like this? Is a really painful thought to have. Now God is to blame. We can blame God for everything then. I can blame him for my drinking problem. I can blame him for my drug problem. I can blame him for my theft problem. I can blame him for any problem that I have because he's the one that made me that way. Instead of it being as he says that all of us are born into sin. We are spiritually dead. And we are born into sin. Instead of calling it what God calls it, we need a scapegoat. So we're going to blame him for it. In case you're, you haven't heard, the new name for the United Methodist Church is called the Global. How appropriate. The Global Methodist Church. And a fact that was quoted in two of these articles was that a quarter, 25% of the United Congre of the United States congregations of the Methodist Church left the United Methodist Church. And one may say, thank the Lord for that. A quarter of them stood up for what was right and true and left. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. But if only 25% left, what does that mean? That means that 75% of the United States congregations stayed. Seventy-five percent stayed. Does that give you a picture of where we are today? We're celebrating the fact that 25% left. And I we can celebrate that fact. But 75% chose to stay. That's a very clear picture of where we stand today. Believe it or not, the Methodist Church has something that's called the Book of Disciplines, which speaks out against such relationships within the Methodist Church. And do you know that though that has been written for who knows how long, 
Do you know that none of that was ever enforced? And now that all this has been voted for and approved, I'm sure they're going to change the language on the Book of Disciplines in order to make it more acceptable to the congregation that they now have, which supports that lifestyle. Don't think that this all just happened overnight, ladies. Do you know how long the Methodist Church has been battling this? For a period of 60 years. And things are now at such a level or a condition in this world that after 60 years, they can finally do away with all of it. Reject God's word outright. And promote the kind of church that we want to have. Looking ahead to the future, The divided denominations are grouped into four main regions, four hot spots around the world. Number one on the list, Africa. Africa. This will be an international effort to continue to build up and to promote this agenda. Africa, number one. Number two, Europe. Europe. Number three, I was shocked. But after rereading, it's exactly what it says. The number three region is the Philippines. The Philippines. This is where compromise gets us every time. And the fourth region is the United States of America. Four hot spots. You could tell by the way these regions accept that lifestyle. And not coincidentally, there are the four top regions of the global Methodist church. Now, lest we think that the Methodists were the only ones that have done this, let me clarify this for you. Because there's some that have gone before them. The first group that has gone through something very similar and split over it is the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church had 1.6 million members. The conservatives that left the Episcopal Church after this agenda with the LGBTQ community. They left and they formed the Anglican Church in America in 2009. 
15 years ago. And do you know how many people make up the conservatives that formed the Anglican Church? 120,000 people. 120,000 split off. And the other 1.48 members, million members, remained as the Episcopal Church, promoting the same agenda. You're not even talking 10%. Meaning over 90% prefer to leave it the way it is. Second example is the Evangelical Lutheran Church. The Evangelical Lutheran Church has got 600 congregations in America. And those 600 congregations split also in 2009. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has had 3 million members. The conservatives again split off and formed what is known the North American Lutheran Church, and here we go again, out of the three million members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, do you know how many split off? 140,000 people. 140,000 out of three million split off. The rest stayed and are promoting the same agenda. The American Baptist Churches, USA, in 2006, and these people are a group in the Pacific Southwest of the United States, they split off, the Pacific Southwest group split off from the American Baptist Church USA in 2006 for the same reasons. But no data was available on that. Two more things. The first one is this. Pope Francis, in July of 2013, supported civil unions for same-sex couples, saying, I quote, God loves gay Catholics. God loves gay Catholics. So while they are not doing civil unions or civil marriage uh, or same-sex marriages in the Catholic Church, yet he is supporting civil unions for the same marriages. On October 31st, 2013, Pope Francis stated that transgender Catholics can be baptized. You know what? Doesn't matter what one's sin is, because it's all sin, and it's all an it's all an offense against a holy God. If that's what one chooses to do, and they will not listen to anything else, so be it. 
but they will face the consequences. What we're doing today, however, is we are promoting this in such a way that we are communicating, including the Pope himself, that God supports it. On the authority of God's word, God does not support it. And just like any other sin, we are called to confess it and repent of it. With all of this splitting off and the amount of people and the percentage of people in these denominations that it represents, it's such a staggering percentage that I am really surprised that the physical church is still here. I don't mean the true church, because it's obviously not time yet for the true church to go anywhere. But how in the world, other than for God's glory, How long will this continue before God begins to pour out his wrath and his judgment? And yet there is still not an ounce of repentance for the sin of man. We blame it on that's the way, blame it on the fact that they think that that's the way we were made. So what choice do we have? Well, you can do that with any sin. But when it comes time for the wrath and judgment of God, I can assure you that will be not even heard by the Lord as an excuse. For any of it. And as this continues, there is no question in my mind that all of this is going to contribute to the apostasy, the great apostasy of the church. Because you know what all this represents? And we're going to look at some scripture regarding this. You know what all this represents? Apostasy. The church and individuals are committing apostasy in growing numbers, staggering numbers. So before we look at the passages, let's first define a general definition of apostasy as well as a definition of spiritual apostasy, which will lead into identifying two kinds of apostasy, which will then lead us to some scripture verses that we're going to take a look at together. First of all, a general definition of apostasy. It is the abandonment or renunciation of a religious or a political belief. Abandonment or renunciation 
of a religious or political belief. The definition of spiritual apostasy is a defiance of an established system or authority. It is a rebellion and it is an abandonment or breach of faith. There are two main types or kinds of apostasy. The first is a falling away from the key and true doctrines of the Bible into heretical teachings that claim to be Christian doctrines. turning away from true doctrine and replacing it with heretical teaching that claims to be Christian doctrine. A good example of this kind of apostasy is the Catholic Church. Upholding to doctrines that are not even found in the scriptures, like purgatory, for example and the worship of Mary, and on and on it can go. The second kind of apostasy is not just falling away from the key and true doctrines of the Bible. The second kind of apostasy is a complete renunciation of the Christian faith, which ends up resulting in a full abandonment of Jesus Christ. One turns away from key and true doctrines and replaces it with heretical teaching. The other leads to a complete renunciation of the faith itself and an abandonment of Jesus Christ himself. In the majority of cases, the first kind of apostasy will lead to the second. Meaning, if you could easily turn away from the true doctrines of the scriptures and believe a lie in the heretical teachings that people put forth, at some point, you will end up renouncing the faith and completely abandoning Jesus Christ. It's when we get to that second level of apostasy that you hit a point of no return. Once you have turned your back on the Lord, once you have abandoned Christ and the cross, Once you have abandoned the atonement he made on the cross, then there is no means left for us to be saved. In John chapter 6, the apostles, or not the apostles, the disciples that listened to Jesus' teaching who ultimately turned away from Jesus, saying, this is a difficult teaching. Who can accept it? These were people that understood exactly what Jesus was saying. They didn't turn away because they didn't understand what he was communicating, they turned away because they abandoned him, because they would not accept the truth.
That is apostasy. That's the second and final apostasy. Because once you turn from Christ and the atonement of the cross, and you reject the doctrines of Scripture, you turn from God. You don't even pick up the Bible anymore. You don't study it, and you only skim through it rather than read it. It's going to result in you abandoning Christ. And that's when the Lord himself will send a strong delusion. that these people will receive and they will never get out of. So let's take a look at some of the key passages. I'll read them for you. I'll give you the address if you want to write it down. You may want to refer to these. Let me clarify something right up front. We're not talking here in these passages that I'm going to give you. We're not talking here about people stumbling and falling into sin. That's something that they can still confess and repent of. We're not talking about that. We're talking about when genuine saving faith is absent. When there is no Holy Spirit dwelling within the individual and everything that they do is in light of an experience that they had. Rather, than receiving the gospel of grace and being truly saved and transformed. That's the difference. In Romans 7, Paul says that though we are saved, though we are born again, we're still in the flesh. And being in the flesh means we're still going to sin. But we can confess that and repent of that. But when there was no genuine salvation, there was no genuine receiving of the gospel of grace, they were never born again. These individuals were never saved in the first place. And so they hit a point that they will turn away and abandon God and his word and the cross and Jesus Christ himself. That's hitting the point of no return. That's the second apostasy. The final one. Where there's no returning. Now let's take a look. At some scripture passages. That you can again refer to. As you have time. Let's first go to the book of Jude. The book of Jude. In the book of Jude, we will just, it's only one chapter. So we're just going to look at a, one or two verses here. Jude, verse 4. Verse 4 says this.
For there are certain men who have crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You are not just talking about sin. You're talking about complete abandonment of Jesus Christ. That's apostasy. Please go to 1 John, which is just before Jude. 1 John chapter 2, and let's look at verse 19. 1 John 2.19 says this, John speaking, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You see, this is not just turning from the faith and sinning. This is an abandonment of the Lord and of the faith itself. Neither apostasy is good. But the one where we turn from Christ and his word, and we reject Jesus, we reject God, we reject the cross, that apostasy, Paul says, nothing can be done for. By turning from the faith, by turning from the truth, they have now left themselves with no way of being saved. The next passage is 1 Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 1. First Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1. We'll have a short passage in Second Timothy as well. First Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1 says this. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created, to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Paul is telling Timothy, the end of days is coming, and with that, you can expect to see apostasy all throughout the church. Not just from the members, but you will see pastors, elders, deacons, etc., turning away from the truth. 
and abandoning Jesus Christ himself. I'd say we've already got churches that qualify for that, including this last one. I'd say we have leaders, including the Pope himself, that have long abandoned Christ and are only upholding the false doctrines of the Catholic Church and who lean more on the traditions of man than God's word itself. That's all qualifies for one form or other of apostasy. It's all over the place. That's the point. We need to see this. Because we are called not to compromise. And yet, that is all that the physical church has done, is compromise. That compromise is going to lead to abandonment. Let's take a look at 2 Timothy, please. Also, uh, in chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4. We're going to look at verses three through five. Starting in verse three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into and unto fables. But watch, in all things endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. This was all within the beginning period of the church. This was before Paul was even martyred. These things were already being warned about. It's been 2,000 years, ladies. We have no idea the extent of this already. but you're gonna see it, and you're gonna see it very, very clearly. Please turn to 2 Peter chapter two. 2 Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two, let's start in verse 20. which says this. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog 
is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, please. The book of Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, we've got two short passages. The first one is found in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. The author of Hebrews says this in verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is still called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And then also in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. And again, before I read this, this is one of those verses or passages that there's some disagreement on. So let me just say up front that these particular verses in Hebrews 6 do not teach that one can lose his salvation, whether it be through unbelief or apostasy. But it rather refers to a situation whereby that some may think that they could turn back, but who were never saved in the first place. And they turn back from the truth to a lie. See, no one really knows the heart of man except for the Lord. People can tell you everything that you want to hear, but it doesn't mean they really believe it. It doesn't mean that they've actually repented. It doesn't mean that they're born again. We see this time and time again. So we're not talking about someone who is saved losing their salvation. But we're talking about those like John addressed in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, where people give the impression that their faith is genuine. But at some point, since it isn't, they will turn away and they will follow them no more. They will be with them no more. These people didn't lose their salvation. They never had it. That's the difference. So Hebrews 6 is not talking about the redeemed. It's talking about those that have had a taste of the things of God. but who were never saved. They were never born again. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves 
the Son of God afresh and put him in open shame. You can't abandon Jesus and still be saved. Yet, if we do abide in him as he abides in us, we remain secure in him. Those that are his can't fall away. But those that are basing it just on an experience, or just the emotions around them from worship songs and that kind of thing. You can listen to that all day, every day, and still not be saved. Those are the ones that will turn away. And they will end up rejecting Christ. The final passage that we're going to look at together is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul lays it out very clearly here, and he will show us what happens when people do fall away or turn away, or abandon the Lord. We'll see what those consequences are. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Again, Paul said that 2,000 years ago. Where do we stand now? If time and if Christ was already at hand. Paul goes on in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's coming a day where people receive not the love of the truth, 
And without the truth, there is no means by which we can be saved. God himself, as punishment, will send a strong delusion. And these people that have turned from the truth and abandoned Jesus will end up believing a lie from the delusion that God himself sends. This is the Lord giving them over because of the fact that they have abandoned Christ and turned from the faith. Again, we're not talking about people who are truly saved. We're talking about people who are basing it on an experience, who are partakers up to a certain point. But when something comes along that sounds better to them and less restrictive, they're the first ones to turn away from the truth and end up believing a lie. They reject the God, the God of all, the creator God. They reject Jesus Christ and the atoning work on the cross. They reject the very word of God. They add to it, they take away from it. They believe what they want to believe. Sound familiar? It's exactly what the physical church is doing today. They love what God hates. And they act almost defiantly. daring God to punish them because they are so sold out to thinking that God is a God of love that God would never ever send any of his children to hell that God will only love them and accept them. I don't know where they come up with that, but I can assure you, you will find that absolutely nowhere in the scriptures. The great apostasy is going to fuel the global one world religious system, which has nothing to do with the worship of the true God. Rather, it is the unification of mankind all over the world. They can pick and choose their own God, Because according to the Pope, it doesn't matter. We all worship the same God, which is also a lie. You're surrounded by lies and deception. We must stay grounded in the truth or we too will fall. Apostasy is already here. Apostasy has been here for 2,000 years. And what we're witnessing in our day is apostasy beyond what we have ever seen. And it's all about the unification of man. It's got nothing to do with worshiping God. 
which fits in perfectly with the one world government and the one world religious system. Ladies, though the one world religious system is not here completely yet, it's still being formed, but it is here. It's here. The fact that we are encouraged to believe in any God regardless of their name shows it's already here. The fact that there is apostasy all over the place and by far the majority are turning to sin and rebellion and the things that God hates instead of holding to the truth and doing what's right. The faithful, percentage-wise, are maybe 5 to 10%. The majority that are turning away make up the rest. It's here. And what needs to be done now that this is already established and there's church leaders all over the world promoting this, the great apostasy will finish strong. And the majority of those who had some kind of a profession of faith, though not a true one, are going to end up turning from the truth and believing a lie. And they will be a part of this one world religious system, which will be an abomination in the eyes of God. Kind of like it is right now. And then at God's appointed time, the Antichrist will take over. His goal hasn't changed since he fell from grace. His goal is to be like God. His goal is to receive all worship, honor, and glory for himself. And you know who's going to give it to him? The false church. That's who's going to give it to them. Do you think we're far off from that? As I speak to you, it's already happening. Check it out. Where we need to stand has not changed. We must walk with the Spirit. We must walk with the Lord. We must remain grounded in his word and truth. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we must remain faithful to the end. May it be so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wake-up call. Thank you for your word and truth. Thank you for helping us to get a clearer picture of what's really going on. The apostasy has not just started. The apostasy has been already going for 2,000 years. But in our day, it's going faster and the falling away is coming even quicker than it ever has before. Whole denominations are turning away, or at least the majority by far. Lord, may we, may, may we remain grounded in truth. Keep us close to you, Lord, and continue to draw us closer. May it all be for your glory and the glory of Jesus Christ. Keep us faithful to the end.
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. And I pray that you'll have a great rest of your day or evening.